Well, everybody, welcome to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. Today, um, as we like to do on Mondays, is take deep dives into new tech. Um, and today is no different than most Mondays, but we have a trio of um, folks here. We're going to talk about um, integration in OpenShift, specifically integrations using um, Apache Camel and Apache Kafka. Um, we have uh, Zanib, Rachel, and Maria are here, and um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell us where they are in the world, and then there's going to be a whole lot of demoing going on today. So um, ask your questions in the chat wherever you are, whether you're on Twitch or Facebook, YouTube, or here in Blue Jeans with us, and we will re relay the questions um, and try and get them all answered for you. But without any further ado, um, please um, take it away, and let's uh, we have a full hour, so let's get started. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hi. So, yes, we are three software engineers that are working in um, Apache Camel some way or another. Um, we, both, we three work for Red Hat Engineering, and we want to tell you things about how to do good integrations in OpenShift or any other Kubernetes-like cluster native. So, let's start with what are integration frameworks how to do integrations the proper way. So usually when we talk about integrations, what we are talking about is when you are building a software architecture and you have different components, maybe databases, it may be APIs, it may be, I don't know, maybe you want to connect to some FTP to some custom service. And uh, you have to define in your architecture what is going to be the workflow of data between one component to the next. Maybe you have to connect to some component to go to another component and then go back. Maybe it's a flow that it's more linear. But in the end, you have to define uh, or consider for your software architecture not only the specific logic of how the data or the flow is going to go from one component to the other, but also you have to consider how to connect to these components. And if you take, for example, if you want to connect to Salesforce, you have to learn how uh, the authentication works, how the API works, what are the formats, what are the protocols. And then maybe you have to go to a database and then you have to learn how uh, the authentication goes, how, what are the pool of connections to connect to a database. And all this um, is usually a task that is repeated over and over again by many, many software engineers, by many, many developers. And we write and rewrite the same lines of code to how to connect to some um, component, how to connect to another. And yes, it's true that usually it's type of component has their own um, client library they can use, but even then you have to learn how to use that client library. And you have to um, consider uh, monitoring if there, that you have to upgrade that client library, maybe because the API of the component change, or maybe because there is some security issue that forces you to upgrade the library. And then your architecture starts getting bigger and bigger and hard to maintain and uh, very coupled one component to the next. So this is what integration frameworks are for. They are the things in between components, so you don't have to worry about all of these things. You can forget about um, how each component work or how to interact with each component or if there is any issue you have to consider, for example, uh, when you connect to some database, any uh, considerations you have to do about the encoding, the authentication, security issues. And integration frameworks, or at least good integration frameworks, uh, should not only help you connect to the components, but also they should help you define the workflow. So, um, for example, uh, you can define that first you go to the A component, then you go to the B component, and now you have a conditional, and maybe you go to the B, C, maybe you go to the D component, and it depends. And this is uh, what the enterprise integration patterns are. 
different ways of uh, defining workflows. Maybe it's a loop, maybe it's a conditional, maybe it's a broadcast. There are many different patterns for communications or for creating workflows. And this is what a good integration framework should give you, a way to connect to components uh, transparently on a decoupled way, um, easy, of course, and also offers you um, the way of defining the logic of the workflow on a good way. Uh, we want to talk to you about Apache Camel, and um, this is roughly how Apache Camel works on the inside. Um, you have different endpoints that are specialized into connecting to external systems. It may be an endpoint that connects to a database, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. This endpoint, uh, when interacting with an external system, generates a datagram, which we call the exchange, which is the message. This message can have um, all kinds of uh, data inside, and it can have um, headers, attributes, not only the, the response from the external system, but also some uh, attributes to give context. And this message goes to the router, which decides what is going to be the following step, and sends this message, this exchange, to the next endpoint, which will interact with an external system, return, generate a message, go again to the router, and the router decides which is the next step, et cetera, et cetera, until the flow finishes. Um, why do we like Apache Camel? Well, it's open source, which is always a good warranty of good software, but also it's very, very lightweight. It has uh, more than 350 types, different types of connectors, which means it's difficult um, to find a use case. It's not already covered. And if you find a use case that it's not already covered, this is open source, you can create your own connector. And the idea is that Camel offers you a domain-specific language to define the workflows, which is very, very simple. For each step, usually it's just one line of code. And you can forget about most of the implementation details on how to connect to that component. Even you can easily replace one component with another. For example, at some point, instead of using an FTP, you want to use an uh, S3 um, storage uh, system, and it's very easy to change it because uh, Camel is prepared to think on how to connect easily um, different steps. This is why Apache Camel usually uh, gets called the building blocks of software because you can easily define how to connect one component with the next. You can connect this easily, but you can also replace this easily with another component and maybe have different flows. Um, this allows you to focus on your use case logic and focus exactly on what is what you want to do, not focus on how to connect to some external system and learn how this external system works. Uh, these are hello world examples of uh, Camel. Camel allows you to define, it has the DSL, but it allows you to use different languages. For example, here in green, we see how it will be in JavaScript, which is just a, a timer that every second it prints a hello world in a log. In blue, we see the Java version, which is exactly the same as the JavaScript because it's the same DSL, but it has all the decorations of public, class, extend, root builder that it needs to be interpreted as Java. And then on the orange, we have a YAML version of the same thing. You can see you also have a from a timer, then a step that is uh, setting a body that is hello world, and then log to uh, an info. So it's very, very easy to define um, any type of workflow in Camel. And you can choose the language of your preference, the one that you are more comfortable working with. When to use Apache Camel? I would advise you to use it always, because um, there's unless you have a very, very contained application that doesn't interact with anything else, it really helps you to keep the, the coupling very low, and it helps you to keep your system very easy to maintain. 
But also, uh, this is especially useful when you have very complex architectures with a lot of different components, so you can forget about uh, caring how to interact with all these components. But specifically, if you have a very dynamic architecture, so you have to add and remove steps of your workflow, or you want to be able to add and remove steps of your workflow easily, like replacing an FTP with S3 or replacing a database with Elasticsearch or whatever you can think of. Seriously, using Apache Camel will help you a lot in making this very easily. And now Sineb uh, is going to talk to you about Melquarcus, Sineb. So you stop sharing so that I can share my... So let me know if you see my screen because I don't see it. I can see it. Oh, cool. Uh, so here comes my part. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to the Kama Quarkus project. It's an Apache Camel sub-project uh, that brings all the awesome integration capabilities of Apache Camel and all the components that are available in the Apache Camel project in the Quarkus platform. So um, to explain how awesome this project is, uh, let's have a quick overview of what is Quarkus and see how Camel fits into this platform. So uh, Quarkus, it's a um, Kubernetes uh, native Java stack that is tailored for GraalVM and OpenGDK um, uh, uh, hotspots. And its main goal is to make Java run better in those modern cloud native microservices and serviceless architectures. It really focuses on Kubernetes ecosystems and how things uh, run in containers. We say that uh, Quarkus is a supersonic, subatomic Java uh, because it's, um, uh, it addresses the two main problems that the uh, Java language has in those container-based architectures, which are the memory footprint and the starter startup time. So it's supersonic because it's way uh, faster at startup than traditional Java projects. Uh, we can see here in the slide, we have two examples of uh, comparison between uh, a traditional Java application and uh, a Quarkus on JVM and Quarkus on native uh, for the time to first response, which actually include the boot of the app plus the first response time of the REST endpoint. So here we have an example of REST endpoint and here a REST that does something in a database. So we can see that when we are Quarkus with JVM, we already have a big difference in the startup time. But when we are on native mode via GraalVM, uh, the, the difference is so uh, impressive. So when we are on those, um, environment like uh, Kubernetes uh, and OpenShift, uh, we can really uh, gain a lot in uh, those environment and style of architectures when we have to deploy uh, our apps very, very uh, frequently and also that we need actually to uh, scale up and scale down uh, uh, very quickly our apps. And it's subatomic because of the lower memory footprint. So here again, we have uh, a comparison between Quarkus native and Quarkus JVM and a traditional uh, Java stack. So we can see that we really gain a lot in the cost of the memory footprint. Another benefit is the developer joy uh, in the Quarkus ecosystem. They make um, a lot of focus on the developer experience and to make things uh, very easy. And also there's this uh, awesome uh, live reload uh, that is uh, game changing for a Java developer point of view, when you can just 
say, uh, uh, run your, your code in developer mode, uh, save uh, your, uh, your code that you just edited, and it just automatically refresh without you do anything. Um, again, in, in a Java ecosystem, it's really something amazing. And it has a um, very large uh, bench of standards and lots of libraries, uh, all the well-known libraries, you can find them there. And you can really find your joy uh, to do a Quarkus app. You can find like very a large, uh, you can do like everything you want. And of course, it, there is our project, which is Camo Quarkus. Uh, that is available there already in the platform. Uh, you can have all the uh, integration capabilities of Apache Camel that are available ever, already in the Quarkus platform. And you can do um, your integration with Quarkus and your app with this integration would be well suited for a Kubernetes environment. And it would, it would take advantage or of all the performers uh, that comes from Quarkus. So we will have uh, your camel connectors that will have a faster startup, faster scale up and down, lower memory usage. So, and uh, there are already lots of extensions. Uh, if we go to the uh, Apache Camel uh, website in the Camel Quarkus uh, section, there is a page about all the extensions that we have, and we can see here that we have like already more than 300 extensions, and you have all the information about every extension that we have. So you can like we have like um, in Camel there is 300 something, so we have already like a bunch of extensions there that you are already available to use in the Quarkus platform. And of course, we benefit from the same developer experience uh, for Quarkus development. So now it's the demo time. Uh, so uh, with Rachel and Maria, we build uh, a demo that we're going to build in different steps uh, during this presentation. And uh, what we're going to do is to have uh, three different connectors one of them is going to pull data from Telegram and push it to a Kafka topic, and another one from Twitter to a Kafka topic. And then we will have another one that will take the aggregated data from Kafka to Elasticsearch for uh, future data science usage. The idea of the whole demo is to uh, show you different uh, types of camel connectors that we can uh, build uh, for OpenShift. So for the first part, I'm going to show you um, the Twitter to Kafka, and I'm going to use Camel Quarkus for this. Uh, this is going to be the part where I'm going to do some Java code. But if you are not a Java developer, don't worry. It's super accessible, and stay tuned for the rest of the presentation. So now let's go for some uh, coding. Uh, so I have my application here, and uh, what I wanted to demo is that I created it from the code.quarkus.io, and I just uh, selected the, the extension, the camel extensions that I want, which are the Twitter, uh, the Kafka one, and I need some logs, so I took also the camel log. And I just uh, downloaded the zip, and it's created me an app. And the app I have already all in the Maven pom file. It has already all the dependencies that I need. It has also the build info that I have, like the native profile to um, to um, build my native app. Uh, it has also the, the Docker file, so I don't have to care about everything. Like, uh, I can just pick the app, and I have a first REST endpoint just to test, and I can actually um, just run the code, and I will have my first REST endpoint. So I don't need this REST endpoint. Uh, I, I, uh, so I'm just going to delete this class because I don't need it. And what I 
want to do is to build actually a Twitter route. I just have to mention that I've already added, I don't know if I'm, I hope I don't go fast. I have added some uh, properties here. Here I have what the um, Twitter component needs um, as key uh, so that it access my account, uh, my developer account at Twitter so that I can go and do some search uh, on the tweets. Um, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start the the camel route that is going to do some search uh, from Twitter. And I'm going to do it in a dev mode. So we're going to see that the code is going to refresh automatically. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to create my routes. And here it's Twitter search. If I do some mistakes, let me know. And what I'm going to search is the Apache Camo. And for a first step, I'm just going to log the, the result that I have from this consumer. So if it gets something uh, new, I will know it. But generally, the consumer takes like uh, the five last uh, tweets uh, that have the Apache Camel. And then if there are new tweets, uh, we will see some new tweets coming. Um, so that I have a, a bigger terminal, I'm going to my terminal. So I'm just going to do the Maven command, Maven compile, Park is dev. And it's it's built in my app, and now so here, yeah, it was quick. So here the app started. It uh, it it searched for my uh, environments uh, variables that I put um, because actually the what I didn't say here in the properties that those ones are already available as environment variables. So I just uh, put the names and I have them uh, already available in my environment. And so the root Twitter search already started. And here it logs actually the, the last tweets that have Apache Camel in them. Uh, what I want to do actually for our demo, I don't know if I have it here, is that uh, to know on the Kafka topic, if the, the message comes from Twitter or Telegram, I'm just going to change the, the body of the message. So I'm, uh, and I'm going to leave my app running here. And I'm going to go back to my route. And I'm going to do a step body. And I'm going to transform it. But here, I'm just going to copy past so that I don't do any mistakes. <laughs> and here what I'm doing is that I'm I'm building a JSON message. I'm putting the body in the Lightning uh, property and I'm telling it that it comes from Twitter. So now if I go back here, IntelliJ uh, will auto save my code and here we saw that it started like without me doing anything. And now my messages are in those JSON formats. So now what I want to do is, is to push this data to, uh, to my Kafka topic. So here I'm going to do two, which is my last part. And I'm going to say that is Kafka. And I'm just copy past the name of the topic so that it works. If I go here, actually, it's reloaded. But I have uh, an error because I don't have access to my Kafka um, topic here on my machine. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to stop it. And I'm going to build this time and push uh, deploy, actually, to my OpenShift project. So just to show you, I am already uh, connected 
to my project here. So I can do a Maven clean package and I tell it that I want to deploy on Kubernetes and I'm going to tell you how this magic magically done. So what I what I've done is that I I've added actually um, two dependencies. Uh, one actually uh, that is the Quarkus OpenShift that will uh, let me deploy my app to OpenShift, and I also added the container image Docker because I personally want my uh, app to be on the container bef before I just push it and. Here I have some um, some configuration uh, about how I'm going to build my image uh, and some Kubernetes uh, stuff like the name that I want to give to my app. Oh, so it actually already uh, built uh, my image and sent it to uh, my OpenShift. So let's go and see. Uh, so here I am on my OpenShift view, and uh, here just on the administrator, I wanted to uh, to show you that we have already installed the StreamZ operator for Kafka, and if we go here, we have a cluster, and uh, we're looking for the topic, and here we have the the topic that we're gonna use. So I'm going to go to my developer view and uh, my app is failing. Uh, here I just um, put a, um, a, um, a container, uh, I, I have put an application that is just consuming from this uh, topic so that I can get the logs there and the code is is here actually I just did the consumer that consumes from the Kafka topic to log this is just for me actually to see if everything's going um, from my other app and if I go back to the topology uh, here my apps doesn't want um, to start uh, if I go to the logs it's uh, it's actually the problem of the properties that I have, like the Twitter access token and everything that are not available. So what I did is that I've already created um, a secret with all the variables that I had on my computer with the Kafka bootstrap uh, broker URL and the four uh, keys and, uh, and secrets that I need for my Twitter account. So I'm just going to add it to um, my app, save it, and I'll go back to the topology, and here it's running. So if I go to the log, this time it, it, there is no error. I don't know if you can clearly, and I have uh, five five tweet search that I pushed to uh, to Kafka. There is something uh, that I wanted to show here is that the app uh, with the Twitter uh, camel route started in 435 milliseconds. I'm just going to write it here uh, so that we can see uh, later when we will do the native uh, mode uh, that is going to start quicker. Um, so I I didn't expect that the consumers has already some <laughs> some Kafka things, but this is why because we are. Uh, so I don't know if it got some uh, new uh, tweets. Maybe I can tweet something. Um, yeah, I, I am tweeting oh, on the back, so yeah. that's why you have things there. Um, so I'm I'm gonna just uh, put the 
the native uh, build. I'm not going to push it because it's going to take some time, but actually it's the same command. And what we do is that we give that uh, native profile that we have already in our app, and it's going to take more time to build uh, because like we we saw in the, the slides when we are on the native, uh, we have a lower memory footprint and uh, faster startup. So, so there is a, a, a whole work uh, done in this phase uh, so that we analyze the code and put just what we need for the app. But I have already um, created a, a Docker image uh, for it. So I'm just going to stop this one. Maybe. And uh, I'm going to copy the name. So I'm going to go here, and this, this time I'm going to add it as a container image. So it got got it from Docker Hub. And it is a Quarkus app. I can, so it's okay, I can create it. Oh, so this is the native app. It has the same problem um, that we had with the secrets. So I'm going to add the secret to my new app. I'm going to save. And the deployment was very quick. And like you can see here, it's the same app, the same uh, camera routes, but instead of starting in 435 milliseconds, it started in only seven milliseconds. And it's already um, already getting some um, some tweets. Um, so this is it. Instead, if someone wants to tweet something and we see it live, I can uh, I can stop sharing and uh, and it's for Rachel now. Great, thank you, Sineb. Let me see. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, just a, a quick recap. Uh, so far we have, uh, we've learned about the benefits of using an integration framework. Uh, we learned that, uh, that CAMEL is the absolute best and most robust integration framework in the whole wide world. Uh, we also learned about writing crazy fast Java applications using Quarkus and how we can use uh, Quarkus extensions to uh, to leverage all of the benefits of, of Camel. So where does that leave us? Well, when you look at the big picture, uh, mainly the development processes, it's a lot. Uh, it's a lot to learn, it's a lot to do, uh, because if you think about it, the majority of the time I spend handling dependencies and doing things like preparing for deployment to OpenShift or Kubernetes. Uh, you have to configure Docker or S2I, uh, you have to create a container, build the image, all of that can get pretty daunting. So, uh, so we wanted to create something specifically made for serverless that is also uh, smart enough to do those uh, kind of repetitive and time-consuming tasks for us. But at the same time, we also wanted it to work uh, natively on Kubernetes. And even more importantly, we wanted uh, to lower the barrier to entry and to eliminate a lot of the associated complexity and to make it easier uh, for people to, to learn and kind of um, to pick up on it. So naturally, uh, the thought process behind all of this was that um, the, CAMEL, the Apache CAMEL project needed to evolve a bit 
to accommodate this requirement, mainly uh, to be able to work with uh, serverless and microservices architectures. The thing is that we didn't want to reinvent the wheel because Camel solved already a lot of the, the problems that integration developers have been facing for years. So one of the thought one of the thoughts was, um, well, how can we modernize it uh, for these architectural trends and changes? And just like with the Quarkus uh, project, a sub project of Apache Camel was created so that you get the same benefits from it. Except this is uh, well, it's native to, to, to native to Kubernetes as well, and specifically for serverless. Um, and as a result, it was uh, it's called Camel K. So what exactly is Camel K and how does it work? Uh, Camel K runs on top of Quarkus, first of all. Uh, it enables developers to write very small, fast Java applications like you just saw. Uh, one of the biggest benefits, I think, is that uh, Camel K handles Camel dependencies for you, which is a huge win. Uh, and, and of course, it removes also the need to configure Docker or S2I before deploying to OpenShift or Kubernetes. That means that you can then continue to focus on writing integrations and uh, just using the pretty much already really simple Camel DSL or domain specific language. No need to worry at all about, um, you know, how am I going to uh, package it, redeploy, redeploy it, um, and, and that kind of thing. So it's uh, straightforward enough uh, to make uh, a Kubernetes native integration application using something like Camel K. Um, so operators, uh, as probably everybody here knows, but operators are commonly used to install and configure applications or platforms, uh, whether it be on Kubernetes or, or OpenShift. And they're the digital version kind of of the traditional human operator that they used to just do all of this manually. So they would have to, um, to install dependencies and everything for, uh, for applications, uh, whether it be in a legacy environment and that kind of thing just making sure everything's in place for the application to be able to run and to do its job. So it's the same uh, in Camel K, except it was really taken to the next level because the operator is quite intelligent and it knows what you want to run. Uh, it, it can understand the Camel DSL. So this, this uh, kind of list here is just to give you a general idea of all of the things that the Camel K operator does and how much time it will really save you. And actually the main uh, responsibility of the Camel K operator is to look for Camel K integrations deployed using Camel and to build and deploy them as Kubernetes applications, just as straightforward as that. And all of that is really possible because of the operator SDK. So it, it basically performs the operations on the Kubernetes resources that are, are needed uh, to run the, the Camel DSL script. And part of that is just it, it defines several new Kubernetes APIs. It uh, extends the, the custom resources. So in other words, the operator scans your application and creates the resources that you need in the cluster automatically. Uh, the three kind of main concepts of Camel K, well, we already discussed uh, mostly the Camel K operator. Uh, it's basically the intelligence that coordinates all of the moving parts. Uh, where each custom resource has its own like dedicated state machine uh, that orchestrates their phases. And there's also the runtime, which provides the functionality to be able to actually run the integration. And then there's traits. Uh, traits, I won't get too into, it's a more kind of advanced concept, but the general idea is that you can just, you can customize the behavior of the operator uh, and the, the runtime. Uh, but typically, for most people, uh, the, the defaults are, are sufficient, but just so that you know, it's possible for an experienced uh, user to, to modify. So to get started with Camel K, first you, you need to have, um, you need to be logged into a cluster you have access to, you have to install the Camel binary, put into your system path, and, and you need to run Camel install to install, to install it. Um, and that will configure the cluster for you with custom resource definitions and install the operator uh, in the namespace. And that's it, pretty much, bing, bang, boom, you're done in, in uh, under five minutes. And actually, if you don't want to deal with the CLI at all, you can just use the, the Camel K operator from the, from the operator catalog on OpenShift, so just through Operator Hub. 
and it can be uh, installed uh, via, via Helm Hub. So writing your first Camel K integration is incredibly simple. Uh, the first thing you do is just create your integration file. Camel K currently supports a bunch of languages just off the top of my head, Java, Kotlin, Groovy, XML, even JavaScript. Uh, and that's quite important to somebody like me because I have to use uh, JavaScript more often than not. And I wanted something that was, was going to be easy to work with and that was, wasn't was like a joke. Um, and so th this was a very low barrier to entry for, for myself as well. So from there, you just deploy your integration with a single memorable line of code, it's quite remarkable. And then from there, you can view the integration in the console uh, if you're using one at all, and you can just check out the logs, monitor its health. Um, but what's probably what's really cool about this that I should probably say is that it's able to just kind of materialize and start up the integrations within just a few seconds. Uh, that helps a lot during the development phase because you get well, you know, you get like immediate feedback on code, and you can make you can make changes right away. So you may be asking yourself, why serverless? What is the big deal with it? Um, well, I'm not here to convince you yes or no, but some of the, the touted benefits are listed here. But mostly nobody wants to have to be predicting their workload. Uh, you can just scale, uh, scale up or down with a couple of commands or clicks of a button. Uh, and with the time that you save, you're also able to get to market faster. Uh, if you need to respond to changes, you can do it more quickly. Uh, but let's see how Camel K handles this. So more often than not, when you read about Camel K in an article or you watch a video, you'll hear about it within the context of Knative. And that's because it works really well with it. Uh, Camel K provides a lot of features when, uh, when it's run on, on Knative. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Knative, I'm not going to go too into depth uh, with it, but uh, it, it basically gives you serverless capabilities on Kubernetes. And there are three major areas uh, in Knative. There's the, the build area that provides you with the custom resources and the Knative serving area. That's the part that helps you with the, the auto scaling and scale to zero so that when there's no traffic, uh, then pods or containers can reduce to zero replicas. And then there's the Knative eventing area, which I think is is more specific to Camel K, uh, where you subscribe to a channel, that, that channel pushes events towards your service. Uh, it just gives you an easy way to trigger your functions uh, at the same time and to orchestrate uh, services. But I think the thing that really makes Camel K uh, shine here is that your service also just receives the, the messages through incoming cloud events, which means that you don't have to actively connect uh, to the broker. So the service ends up being quite uh, passive. Uh, and actually, the Knative trait automatically discovers um, the addresses of Knative resources and injects them into the, into the running integration. And if you have an existing integration already, um, Camel K integration, then uh, it's possible to run it as a Knative serverless um, service. So with serverless becoming a popular architectural style, you'll see many examples, but, um, but it's important, I think, to remember that you don't need to use uh, Camel K for serverless, just using it alone or even to deploy a Quarkus app is very common and useful thing to do and to not get overwhelmed with all the technologies uh, just because they, really, they work really well together doesn't mean that they're dependent. Also, uh, for Camel case, the possibility to set up monitoring, uh, and so that can be done for both the integration uh, and the operator. And I believe for the integration, if you have uh, OpenShift already, then it's the Prometheus operator is already deployed as part of uh, the OpenShift monitoring. And so, for to monitor the um, the operator, you you would just do it at um, the at the moment that you're installing uh, Camel K. Uh, and then, of course, you can then you can um, set up alerting, uh, and you can you can visualize collected data using something like Grafana or or some other API consumer. 
And um, and quite important is also that uh, CAMOK helps with uh, with transformation. So adding a transformation is as simple as you just add a line or two to your to your CAMOL DSL or to your integration. Um, something like converting the outgoing body to uppercase would be an example. You would just add it to a step and you can have as many steps as you like. So uh, I'll be doing just the teensiest, tiniest demo. I uh, is following the theme of adding camel sightings that'll get um, eventually end up in, in a Kafka topic, or not eventually, immediately end up in a Kafka, Kafka topic. This time I'll be reporting my sightings through uh, through Telegram. So I've already created uh, the Telegram bot, but um, but it's very easy to do. You can create it in in under a minute or or so. Um, I'll leave the link in the slides. Okay. So I've already kind of lazily written the integration here. Um, it's it's written in, in JavaScript to kind of change it up, but don't get too jealous. They look almost exactly the same in Java. Um, so here, um, this is just showing that uh, where, where we're starting from. So the input is coming from a Telegram bot. We would add our authority, our authorization token here, set the body. Um, and here we're marshalling it to converting it to JSON, but um, but with Kafka, which is uh, going to be uh, where we're sending it to, it's not really necessary because it does it automatically. Uh, but um, but yeah, then uh, then over here, this is where we're, we're piping it to the, the Kafka topic, uh, setting, setting the body, and then we are sending back to Telegram. Thank you for reporting your Camel sighting. Okay. So it's as simple as we would run, we would just do a camel run, dash dash uh, dev and telegram sightings dot js if I spelled everything properly. So the dev flag uh, basically just, it just means that you're going to get a uh, tail logged um, output from integrations, the integrations Kubernetes pod. It also synchronizes the source changes and reloads the camel context automatically, which I'll show you. Uh, it's doing a lot at this point uh, and building an integration kit and so on. Uh, so from here, we go to the, the OpenShift console. We're in a, the administrator view. Let's go to developer, apology view. And we can see here that the integration is running. Okay, and actually, so we can, we have here the logs, right? There's not much going on. So what we'll do is we have Telegram open, right? And I've uh, opened the chat with the sighting spot. And I'm just going to type something. I'm going to say, oh my God, there's a camel in my house. Boom, thank you for reporting your camel sighting. I've, I've contributed. So you can see here that the that in the log that it, it does get sent right away. Uh, and if I have time, I want to do just a quick, I just want to show you about the, the camel context being reloaded. So if I were to do, um, go back over here. If I were to say, have a nice day, right? Then, of course, it's not a uh, user cannot update. All right. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. But yeah, you're going to have to take my word for it. It will, uh, it will update here and say, uh, have a nice day. I will not, I will not stop this integration now just to show you that. Um, so, but yeah, another thing is that you can also just get the status at any point. Um, so this will show you the running integrations. And of course, I'm not going to do it right now, but you can also camel delete and it will delete uh, uh, whichever integration you specify. And with that, I will just leave you here with, um, just to point out that I've left a quick summary and some, uh, and some resources here, and I'll, uh, I'll leave it to my colleague now to continue.
Thank you. I'm going to share my screen again. So I hope you're seeing my screen. Um, so we have seen that uh, if you want to build complex uh, software architectures, you should use Apache Camel because it, it makes it very easy to interconnect things. Uh, you have seen that, for example, creating a Telegram bot is really, really stupid. In four lines of code, you can create a Telegram bot and that's it. You don't need anything else. Well, you need to add the, the code for your logic. Obviously, if you add commands to the Telegram bot, you will have to generate the code that reacts to those commands. But the, the part of how to integrate with the Telegram bot, how is the Telegram bot API? I don't know. We don't really need to know. We just rely on Camel. If uh, Telegram updates their API on, or how they interact with the with the bots, you don't care. You just upgrade Camel. Camel will take care of it. It will work. So it really, really uh, makes it very easy to develop things that different third-party components interacting. It uh, then we saw that. Well, Camel is running over Java. Java sometimes is not the most uh, fastest, uh, not the best for serverless. Don't worry, we have Camel Quarkus. We can run Camel over Quarkus, so it's serverless, it's fast, it's amazing. And now Rachel told us that Camel K helped us with all the DevOps side of uh, even also the development side. So it's very easy to deploy on OpenShift or Kubernetes kind of cluster. So what else? What can we do to make our lives even easier? Well, that's when Camelets appear. Camelets is a concept that appears, uh, I think it was in October last year, so it's very, very new. The idea is that, well, for uh, creating a Camel um, workflow or a Camel integration, you usually use a lot of different pieces and uh, maybe if you are focusing only on your the logic of your use case um, it may not be as nice as it could be for example if you are a scientist analyzing camel sightings in all over the world through a telegram bot and a twitter api um you want to be able to integrate that with your machine learning platform or whatever easily and you don't want to worry about how to interact with it. Maybe what uh, you want is that some nice developer creates some camelet root snippet, a camelet, that helps you create workflows faster. For example, imagine you have an API that um, is the API that your scientist is using to add new data or run analysis or whatever. But your scientist is not a developer, it's a scientist, so they don't really know how to call the API. Well, don't worry, you can create a camel snippet that um, on a transparent way simplifies a lot all these calls to the API or whatever is the, the workflow, maybe it's not one step, it's more than one step, but you can simplify it so your scientists can build their own workflows on a very easy way with not so many building blocks. So it's like a meta block. Um, this is a very um, can native concept, I think. So it has, um, Camel usually has uh, this uh, consumer producer uh, definition, depending on if the endpoint is reading data from the outside or writing data. And uh, here Camelets have a similar idea. So you have source Camelets, which uh, takes data from the outside and sync Camelets, which write data uh, somewhere. So it's like two different types of steps. and you usually um, create a source camelet snippet that reads the data and a source camelet snippet, a uh, sync camelet snippet that writes the data and you put first a source, then a sync and uh, join them. 
and uh, you usually have only two uh, steps on the um, on your workflow, so you are pinning a source with a sync. The idea is to simplify workflows even more, to be able to, um, at the beginning I told you this is open source, if there is some connector that uh, is not available, maybe you want to um, create your own connector, but that means you have to implement it in Java. Maybe you are not Java developer, maybe you are a um, Jaml uh, DevOps, maybe you are a JavaScript developer and you don't want to work with Java. But if there is a way of defining how this connector would work, for example, Telegram uses HTTP APIs behind, so you could create, if you have the HTTP camel connector, you could create a camelet that wraps how the HTTP connector interacts with uh, the Telegram server and say this is the camelet to interact with Telegram. So it's like an abstraction layer, a um, snippet of code, a meta block. And with that in mind, I'm going to show you how to define a camelet binding. So as I said, it's just uh, a YAML file, very, very simple. This is uh, split in three columns, but it's one single file. You start with a header in the YAML file defining this is a camelet binding. I'm going to bind a source and a sync. And then you define which is going to be the source and maybe some properties, authentication properties, and what is going to be the sync and some authentication properties. So in our use case, we already have the Telegram to Kafka, the Twitter to Kafka. And now we want to collect everything that is sent to Kafka through Telegram and Twitter and uh, store it in an Elasticsearch. And that's the part I'm going to do with Camelets. The Elasticsearch Camelet is not yet, it's only on the snapshot version, it's not on the release version, but it's going to be on the next one because it's already committed, so it's there. Um, and this code you see at the left, is everything you need to write on your file to um, connect from the Kafka to Elasticsearch. Uh, the first um, is the header saying, okay, this is a Camelot binding. The name is going to be Kafka to S binding. Uh, then uh, you can you define the source, which is going to be a Kafka source. You define the URL and the topic no username or password in this case. And then the sync, which is where I'm going to write the data, which is going to be Elasticsearch. And here I have to define the URL, the cluster name, the index name, which is how Elasticsearch defines uh, the index and the cluster where you want to write to, and then the username and password. And um, this is the file, I think it's, in better here with more colors. Uh, of course, I'm not going to show you my password, but what I'm going to do is just um, use this file with the proper password and um, add it to uh, the cluster. This is the current topology. So if I add this, it should appear here any moment now, here we have the new Kafka to Elasticsearch binding, which is already running, and I can see the logs. Uh, this is not going to read from the beginning of the Kafka, so everything that has been sent up till now is lost, but what I can do is, for example, tell the Telegram bot, uh, I, I see a camel in my desk. And here is almost instantaneously, I see a camel in my desk. Um, I added some um, logging here. Connecting to the cluster. Can you, can you increase the the font? Okay. Better? Yeah. 
I say Gamelin my desk, it comes from Telegram, I connect it to the Elasticsearch and I store it with this ID. So uh, if I, for example, retweet something with Apache Camel, uh, I should see that here when the, the Twitter uh, thing, where is it? Which I'm not sure it's going to be. Here it is. Um, from Twitter, I have this tweet. Uh, so let's check that this is really on uh, Elasticsearch. Well, I have here things from uh, last week when we were uh, testing things, but if, for example, I search Telegram latest, I see a camel in my desk. If I search for Twitter latest, uh, the one I just retweeted with the pineapple. And um, I don't know if, well, we have been already one hour talking, so maybe it's time for just uh, opening questions or chatting a bit about this. Uh, about camel, we can talk hours and hours about this topic, but I think it's better if just we do like we did, just review a bit the state of the art of camel, starting with classic traditional camel, moving to camel quarkus, then camel k, then camelets, and then let's see what people want to hear about. I think the recap of where it's going is would be great, so go for it. Well, um, what I see right now is that um, we are mo we are pushing a lot in the serverless side, much more than in previous years. The, the Camel Quarkus is very active. I think Zineb can talk there more about how active it is Camel Quarkus. Uh, I'm right now working on the Camelet side, which is, as I said, the concept was born last year at the end of last year, and um, there is some uh, very good articles from Nicola explaining uh, where this comes from and uh, where this is going. And we only have like 20 camelets comparing with the 350 something connectors on camel. So this is a very small subset of camelets, but I think it's it's improving a lot and it's going to be very um visual with this uh, topology view in OpenShift. So you can very, very easily connect um, different uh, snippets of code and, and I don't know, in my experience or what I feel is that some people still think that Camel is not as um, easy to um, start with, even if I see it very easy now, but Okay, maybe not as easy to start with. And the Camelet thing is going to push a lot on, on making it even easier because you can now separate your development um, team that can create the Camelets from the people that are going to use those Camelets. That may be scientists, maybe analysts, maybe, I don't know, whoever needs to build the integrations. That that sounds like it's going to be a really interesting community to work in too. Is creating the new cast. So maybe um, where where should people come to find a space to collaborate on creating new camelets? That might be a good thing to to tweet or put into the. Yeah. So we have, um, of course, we have everything is open source. So we have. The Apache Camel Camelet. Let's put it on the chat so we can tweet it later. This is the, the community repository of all the Camelets that are there. I see that there has been uh, many in the latest days, even hours ago. So this is this is uh, this is getting a lot of speed in increasing more Camelets every day. And of course, the the Apache Camel website is the place you should go first to see any kind of documentation. We have uh, we have different top uh, places for uh, Quarkus, Camelets, and Camel K, and uh, even Apache Kafka connector, uh, Camel Kafka connector, which is something that is also merging Kafka and Camel and is there and has its uses, but 
we uh, prefer not to introduce that also on this uh, talk because it will be just too much. Yeah. Well, I think that means we're going to have to have you guys back to do another one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, because this has been like it's this is amazing um, the the demos of like some and shining the light on um, these future integrations and what's what's available now is pretty amazing um, and you know you shouldn't hesitate to get involved in the camel universe um, and Quarkus universes um, I think we the, its time has arrived. Zinib, um, did you want to add any final words around where you you see things going these days? What's next for your adventures? Uh, well, for me, I'm on the Camel Quarkus side. Uh, for now, there is this uh, Quarkus 2.x that we were working on. And of course, like uh, uh, the whole team did an amazing job to, to have so many uh, extensions there. And uh, there's still some work because some of them are not uh, ported now on native and uh, there's always so much work and uh, if you want to get involved in the community just uh, come and see and talk to us on the mail on the Zulip chat and uh, yeah there's lots of work to do there always is and how about you Rachel any final words that you want to slide in here to get people more involved or inspire them thanks I think um, well uh, uh, Recently, 1.4 was just released. A lot of the focus has been around camelets, actually. So a lot of what Maria has said is kind of where CamelK is moving towards. As we just added the the bind subcommand as well, uh, which helps you to use camelets uh, directly whenever you need them. But um, but yeah, and also we're exploring kind of the user interface side of things, like seeing what kind of tooling can be beneficial to to people that maybe it's not less tech savvy but maybe maybe don't want to code or maybe want just kind of like a visual way of of working with the integrations um that's about it well as the camlet world spins and 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 develops we'll definitely have you guys back um and maybe even a walkthrough of creating and contributing a camlet um might be a, a great thing a future topic to have you guys back back on and um i'm thrilled with with the depth of the content and the demos so this is really good it's one of the best overviews uh, i've seen explaining the whole camel universe so um thank you very much for this i'm not seeing thank you. questions in the chat i'm just going to pause and see if chris has found any uh, in all of the other places where we're, we're testing none yet so you have answered all the questions or you've left them with just enough mystery that they'll go off and explore for themselves so thank you very much for taking the time I know you're in London and Spain and France and um, time zones are always a fun thing but we totally appreciate you coming and we'll definitely have it back um, yeah this is a big it was a big demo um, but it's a great thing um, to, to try and break camel down into these pieces and parts very digestible so thanks and we'll talk to you all again soon. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks for having Thank us. You.